All right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1203. Hopefully, you're all doing okay. Um, and let's jump into it. There are only two of you here today. Where's everybody else? Okay, there you guys go. All right, looking great. Okay, awesome. Nice of you to join us. Let us get into it. So uh, we're actually going to start calculus today. <laughs> so excited. OK. Um, so last time we spoke about average rate of change. That's going to be important in a little bit. Um, not today, uh, but in a few classes. We're actually going to modify the average rate of change idea to develop something cool. Um, but basically, uh, it was this formula right here. <clears throat> I don't know why there's something in my throat or something. F of B minus F of A over B minus A. This gives you the average rate of change of a function F of X on an interval A, B. Um, it is equivalent to the F of X plus H minus F of X all over H. However, in this context, if someone asks you for average rate of change, chances are this formula is more convenient to you. So that's probably how you should remember it. But you'll notice that it is the difference quotient in either case. Um, so this is a calculation you can do just by uh, using composite functions, plugging into your function, you develop a number. And what that number tells you is how the output changes on average uh, compared to the input. So basically it's just saying as the input increases by one unit, how does the output behave? Um, so in this case, it says that the output decreased by two units. So a negative here means that the output decreases as the input increases, and a positive output here would mean the output increases as the, the output increases as the input increases on average. And then it just kind of, uh, the, the magnitude just compares the two. So here you know that the output is changing twice as fast as the input, uh, but it's changing in the opposite direction. It's decreasing as the input is increasing. So that number can tell you a lot of information about how things are happening on average. In the interim, it might not do that, but overall on the uh, huge time scale, um, that is telling you how it's doing on average. So that was the average rate of change. Um, people still trickling in here. Then we actually spoke about what is calculus. Uh, Hopefully I convince you guys that it's super important, super useful, uh, but actually what it is is what we looked at. Um, it's actually the study of derivatives, integrals, and their applications. And the derivative is something that we use to study the rate problem. The integral is something we use to study the area problem. Uh, rate problem is, means we want to figure out how fast something is moving or something is changing. The area problem is we want to figure out how much space something takes up. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that these are actually the same problem. You're just attacking them from different angles. Um, and so while we knew how to do both of these for millennia, uh, 300 years ago, Isaac Newton and uh, Leibniz showed us that, hey, you can study one by studying the other and there, we can make a unified theory and that would make the study of both of these far more efficient. And this is why we have calculus class now and why everyone thinks that Newton invented calculus and all that, uh, because it was such a cognitive, uh, such a paradigm shift that it was really made a big deal. And it made the study of these two things a whole new field unto itself called the field of calculus. And so that's what we're going to do. And as I mentioned last time as well, um, if you had to say what calculus was about in a word, uh, that word would be limits. So it turns out that these two tools, the derivative and the integrals, uh, derivative and the integral, these are just special kinds of limits. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to study the theory of limits. We're gonna find out what a limit is, how to use them. And then we're going to use our knowledge of limits to develop these two things. Well, first we're gonna develop this and we're going to develop the, the integral like way towards the last third of the semester. Okay, so that's where we're going. That's what we're doing today. We're going to start uh, talking about limits. So uh, yeah. Now, we now start calculus. Yay! And the journey begins. With limits. So let's talk about limits. Okay. 
Now, $64,000 question is, what is a limit? And I don't, I don't really know. I don't know. So I guess we're kind of, I'm kidding. I do know, but I'm not going to tell you. That's because the actual definition of what a limit is, is crazy. There's an, it's called the epsilon delta definition. And that's kind of the definition that, you know, like math majors or like very specialized physics and engineering majors need to know. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an intuitive definition for what a limit is. So it's not the actual definition, but it's a workable definition. It's kind of how I would like you to think about it. And it's going to be useful for everything that we'll need to know how to do in this class. So not the real definition. Um, so uh, we will look at um, an intuitive definition. Sorry, my phone is ringing in my ear. Let me disconnect it from my headphones. So what I'll be giving you guys is an intuitive definition, um, which when it comes to math is not really a definition at all. Um, intuitive definition. Right. But it would be uh, more than uh, useful for uh, a class like this. Um, uh, so here's the fuzzy definition. So let f of x be a function. We say, so here's the phrase that we would use. The, someone's trying to come in. Okay, the limit as x approaches A of f of x is L and write. So this is the notation for saying that phrase. L I M, you write x, little arrow A underneath that. You write your f of x beside this, and you say is L. Okay, so this phrase here means we read it as the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And of course, equal means is, this is what it is, and l is just you know uh, some value, right? So that's the notation. So we can say the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l. Right, that's what we say. And what does it mean to actually say that? Uh, so we say that to mean as X gets close to A, uh, gets close to A, the Y value of f of x gets close to L. And let me kind of uh, modify this a little bit to make sure that we are, we have the spirit of the definition in mind. I'd probably say something like gets close to a value which is unique unambiguous. So that is what a limit is. Um, so in other words, the limit is you're looking for a y value. So I, I want that to be in your heads, i.e. Uh, the limit is the y value you get close to. as the x value gets close to something. So if you're looking for a limit, you're looking for a y value. What y value? 
the y value that the output is getting close to whenever your input is getting close to something else that is of interest, right? And that is what a limit is, right? And here's how we say it, because as I mentioned, notation is super important. You need to know how to write things down. Equally important is you need to know how to sound like you know what you're talking about, right? Like even if you don't know what you're talking about, you need to sound like you know what you're talking about. So you need to know the phrase that we would use. We would use the phrase, the limit as X approaches A of F of X, right? And then I can say that's L, right? Um, that's the symbols I would use to write it down. And what I mean when I say that is as my X values get close to some number A, my Y values are gonna get close to some other number L, right? And I'd be able to tell you what that L is. It's going to be unique, uh, unambiguous. We all should agree on that. Yeah, 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 I guess it is L, right? We all should agree, okay? So that's what a limit is, okay? Um, now, uh, to kind of show you what I'm talking about, let's actually do an example. Uh, so here is an example. If I were to ask you, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of the function uh, 3x minus 1? Okay, so that is the question. What is, the what is this limit, right? The limit as x approaches 2 of 3x minus 1. Okay, so let's actually uh, kind of see what that is. Let's kind of get this intuition going. So I'm going to do a lot of these examples uh, very slowly, kind of, with uh, a lot of pictures to kind of get you the intuition. Eventually, I'm going to teach you a faster way to compute these. But if you don't understand the idea, it's easy to get confused, even if I show you the computations. So for now, we're going to go through some examples where I'm showing you the idea. What's really, what are we really looking for? Um, so we know how to do that. OK, so 3x minus 1, uh, we should know what that looks like. That is just a straight line. Uh, Y-intercept is negative 1. Slope is positive 3. So it's going to look like this. All right, this is y equals 3x minus 1. Now, of course, you can uh, solve for the x-intercept here. Set y equals 0, solve for x. That will give you that this guy is passing through 1 third. Now, obviously, the number that we care about is 2. So let me put in a 2 here. So that's the 2 that we care about. So I want my x to get close to 2. Okay, so here is how we how we want to think about this. And uh, at first, it's going to seem needlessly complicated, but it's very important that you this is how you think about it. Okay, so what happens when x gets close to two uh, is what we want to know. Specifically, what happens to the y value when x gets close to two? That is the question we're answering. So someone can say, okay, all right. Um, so I'm on my, I'm walking on the x-axis, my x values, they're getting closer and closer to two. Now, of course, if I trace that up to the graph itself and kind of walk up, you know, that means I'm on this side of the graph and I'm moving in that direction. Um, it seems like I'm approaching some value here. And what I'm interested in is if I were to project things over to the y-axis, what that would mean is I'm crawling up, going towards here. So now you see, as I get close to 2, my car correspondingly, my y's are getting close to some value on the y-axis. Now, I am interested in what that value is. Now, someone can also say, OK, but I, I could get close to 2 from over here. So we're crawling from this side which means I'm on this side of the graph crawling down, right? So if I just kind of project that to the graph, and if I project this to the y-axis, because remember the y-values are what we really care about, it's like we're crawling down now, and we're crawling to get close to some value. Now the question is, what is that value? Um, so what is that value? What do you think? What do we get close to? Five. Five, yeah. Whoop -de -doo. Makes a lot of sense, right? And and uh, how how did you get five? Uh, you were able to plug in to the equation, so that would give you that limit. Yeah. So this is five. That would be the answer, right? And that's because as my x gets close to two, my y gets close to five. And at this point, some of you, especially if you haven't seen limits before, 
are probably rolling your eyes like, why did we go through all that? Couldn't we just plug in the two? Aren't you just asking us to evaluate the function at two and tell you the answer? Like, why couldn't we just plug in two? So yes, notice, uh, notice, we could just plug in two to get this. And I understand uh, if you have gripes about that. Uh, but here's the important part, what I want you to get. You will not always be able to do something like that. So yes, there are times when we can just get to the answer by plugging it in. Uh, plug in into the x value, but I want you to appreciate you're not always going to have that option. Uh, here is an example where you don't have that option. What if I were to ask you, what is the limit? Again, let's approach two. And I said x squared minus four over x minus two. What is that? Now, of course, if you paid attention in lecture zero, you would appreciate that we have a very big problem here. You see, Plugging in two is now not possible because if I plug in two, I divide by zero and that's very illegal. Javon's gonna kill me if I divide by zero, all right? So you can't plug in two. So the trick that you had up here that you thought it was so simple, it can't work here. We cannot actually plug in two. So let's actually see what is happening in this scenario there. Then it turns out that there is an answer to this question, but you cannot get to that answer just by plugging in. So let me ask you guys a question. What does this guy look like? What is the graph? So we know the picture here was a straight line like that. What is the picture here? What is the, uh, what does the graph of that guy look like? Uh, doesn't it have a hole in it? Sure, there's a hole at two, but what does the picture look like otherwise? Is it still just a straight line? Why would you say a straight line? Has a square in it. It is a straight line with a hole, but I just want to know <laughs> how did you come like, by that? Because like when you simplify it, you just end up getting x plus two. So that's okay. Way so, way so, here. so, yeah. So, here you have y is equal to, let's do it up in the corner here, that, right? Now we know that our x cannot be equal to two, can't plug in two. But uh, that x squared minus four should remind you of the difference of squares. So, you're like, hey, I could uh, just write this as x minus two times x plus two over x minus two. And then I can uh, like cancel that. And then I can get x plus two. Right. However, don't forget, you weren't uh, x equals two was illegal before. It's still illegal now. You're simplifying the function, but you're just simplifying it on paper. You're writing it in a nicer form, but you're still in the situation where you're not allowed to plug in two. However, as long as we're not two, this thing looks like y equals x plus two. Right. So this is pretty much a straight line, like so where this is passing through two, this is passing through negative two, because um, if I set y equals, if I set y equals zero and solve for x, I would get negative two, right. However, there's an issue here. We're not allowed to plug in two. So the point that I care about, so there's a two somewhere here. That's the point I care about on the graph, but it turns out there is no such point on this particular graph. Uh, let's choose a small eraser. So this, there's like a little gap here. Uh, maybe I should draw it bigger so you can see it in the notes. There's a little gap here. So I, I can't actually be at that point. Okay, 
So I can't actually plug in. It doesn't make sense to plug in there. However, at all other points, I could just simplify, reduce the fraction, and it will give me the same output as the guy uh, x plus 2. So now uh, we play the same game, right? So I decide, OK, I'm going to get close to 2 from here. That means I'm getting close to that there, and which means I'm crawling up to some position here, right? Now, I don't know what that position is yet. And similarly, I could be like, OK, I'm getting close to it, close to here, which means I'm on this side of the graph coming down here, which means correspondingly, I have my y values coming here. So we're both, again, we're closing in on some value, some specific value. So even though the function is not defined at the point I care about, um, I can still find a limit. There is some value that I'm getting close to as my x is getting close to 2. Uh, what do you think that value is this time? Um, is it? Well, I'm just I'm just taking an educated guess right here. But yeah, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like four. Four, right? Because you're like everywhere except that one point, we behave like x plus two, even though we're not actually x plus two. So the thing is, if I could fill in that point and be there the output would have been four at this point because I just plug in two into x plus two and get four, right? So in this situation, we can say the limit as x approaches two of x squared minus four over x minus two is equal to four. Four is the answer. But I want you to appreciate, we couldn't actually just plug that in directly. Now here we were in a situation where we could just like simplify and plug it into the simplified version, even though technically speaking, that was illegal. It allows us to get to the answer that we want to get to intuitively, right? So four would be the answer here. So even though we're, we don't exist at two, um, if we could exist at two, the output would be four. And that is what a limit is about. Hopefully now I'm trying to, I, I, I really want you to get the intuition here of what's the difference between a limit and plugging in a number. Because it's not about being at the number, it's all about getting close, right? If x gets close to something, what does the y get close to, right? We're not considering the situation of actually being there. I don't care if the x actually becomes a. I don't care if the y value actually becomes l. I'm all about, it's all about proximity. What does it get closer and closer and closer to, right? If I kept, keep inching x closer and closer to a, what does the y value inch closer and closer to? I might not even, it, the function itself might not even make sense there, but we do not care. Limits do not care about the actual value of the function, and that's very important. That's what this uh, intuitive definition is supposed to get across. So I don't want you to think about, oh, it's just like plugging in. It's, it's not the same as plugging in. Um, let's, do, let's do another example. And uh, for this one, I'd like to get uh, your opinion on it. What I would do is I would help you out with the graph. I'm going to assume that you would know how to graph this. My screen is misbehaving again. So um, let's go to another example. Let f of x be this, a piecewise function. Um, and what I want is this function specifically, x minus 2 all squared, x less than or equal to 2. Um, and I want it to be 3x plus 1 my x is larger than 2. Okay, So that's our function, a piecewise function. Um, now, hopefully, you'd remember how to graph this, but I, I, I'm not going to, don't want to waste time asking you guys to direct me on how to graph this. So I'm just going to graph it for you. So again, uh, 2 is the, the uh, important part here. Um, so if that's my function, I want us to find the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, right? That's our goal here. Okay. So what does a piecewise function mean? Uh, you want to split up your domain, uh, the region of space, the xy plane, into two parts. There's the part where over here is where x is less than or equal to 2. And then there's the part over here where x is bigger than 2. 
right? You want to split into two halves. And now, two halves. And now what you want to do is on the left side, when x is less than or equal to 2, you want to graph x minus 2 all squared, right? And so that's like taking x squared, shifting it two units to the right. So at that point, it actually ends up at the minimum ends up at 0. That's where the vertex is going to be. And then it's going to be like a quadratic coming off there, right? That quadratic is going to hit at 4, right, if you look at the y-intercept. Okay. So that's that side. And now what we do is for the 3x plus 1, that's what it is on the right side. Now, when my x is 2, my 3x plus 1 is hovering around uh, 7. Right? Just by plugging in that x plus 2, that becomes 7. Um, and then it's just a straight line with positive slope. So it goes up like that. Um, so, uh, when X is two, the left output is a zero, right? So, um, note, uh, when X equals two, your F of two is equal to zero. Okay. So that's the, the value. Okay. Okay. So this is our picture. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of this function? What do you think? So remember, there's a hole up here at 7, and it's filled in here at 2. Um, and the filled in output is zero. Uh, the hole is at level seven. Uh, what's the limit? So when you have a guest, just chime in. picture. Let me make it a little bigger so you can see. Ideas? Guesses, prayers, hopes, dreams. Like, what do you think the answer is? Thoughts, desires. Like, what do you want the answer to be? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Just uh, tell me something. Well, look at what the definition of a limit is. In case you forgot or you didn't write it down, it's up here. We say the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals L. And what we mean by that is as x is close to a, the y value should get close to uh, some unique unambiguous value L, right? So that's the definition of what a limit is. So uh, what is the y value that we're approaching as our x gets close to 2? Right, that's the, that's the question. In this case, wouldn't it be 0? Uh, why would it be 0? Why are you thinking? Um, well, based on the rules from the piecewise function, um, it's bubbled in at um, the coordinate of um, two and zero. So, okay. 
So, I mean, yeah, so when we're coming here, getting close to two, uh, we're on the graph here, moving down. That corresponds to here. So we're getting close to zero. So you think the answer is zero? Yeah, that's my guess. Good guess, very, uh, very uh, common guess, I would say. Um, but let me ask you, if I'm getting close to two from over here, what would that mean? I mean, that would mean I'm on the graph up here, right? And then that would mean I'm actually getting close to seven. Right, you're, you're only thinking of getting close to two from one direction. Um, um, but there's nothing that there's there's nothing in the definition that talks about that. Um, should we do like lateral limits like. Um, yeah. Like um, the left and the right. The one approaches the left side and the one approaches the right side. Lateral limits, I'm not sure. Uh, sure, we, we, we can do that and we will do something like that, but I haven't done that yet. So we haven't gotten there yet. Right now, we're just talking about the general limit. We're talking about this guy. What is that guy? Based on what I just said. So the answer is not zero. Um, and it's not zero because uh, the main thing is you chose it because you saw that it was filled in at there. But remember, uh, and this is what I really want us to get with the definition, you know? So I wrote it down, but I, you know, uh, it's hard to actually make sure that we know what the definition is. We do not care about where it's filled in. We do not care about being at the point. Notice here, we got an answer when it wasn't filled in, but being filled in is not important for the limit at all. So I want you to get that out of your head. Don't think of this as like algebra class when you're plugging in a number, right? Limits care about getting close to something, right? So who is filled in doesn't matter at all, right? I don't want you to think that way, okay? So the fact that we're filled in here and not filled in here is completely irrelevant uh, for a limit. It is relevant if you want to know the value of the function. Like I can say for sure, f of two is zero. That's a true statement. But to say that the limit is zero is not a true statement. Uh, I'm like going on a guess. Is it like, yeah. does it not exist? It does not exist, right? This case, we would say DNE. DNE stands for does not exist. So essentially, uh, the limit in this scenario is undefined. It's not a thing that we can describe with this language. Um, however, we don't use the phrase undefined for limits. We use does not exist for whatever reasons. Traditionally, you say it does not exist, right? It actually does not exist. How you know it does not exist? It does not matter who's filled in or who's not. The point is, as my X gets close to two, I want to be able to tell you a unique, unambiguous value that my Y value is getting close to. In this scenario, that is impossible because if you get close from the left side, it goes to zero. If you get close from the right side, it goes to seven. So is it zero or is it seven? It means by definition, you do not have a unique, unambiguous answer. Different people can come to different answers based on what direction they're coming from, right? So you literally cannot fulfill this definition, which means the limit does not exist um, according to this definition, okay? So this is what I mean. It can get a little bit tricky, but it's very important. It, it, only, it only gets tricky if you're thinking about the wrong thing. You should not be thinking about where does my function make sense? Where are the points filled in? Where, like if you're thinking that you're on the wrong track, right? A limit is more nuanced than that. Right, uh, it's it's about as my exit close to some value. Is there some unique y value that I'm getting close to? In this situation, the answer is no. There is no unique y value I'm getting close to. I'm approaching zero from one side, approaching seven from the other side. That's two values. 
by definition, it means not unique. There's more than one value, which means there is no answer. And we say that by writing DNE or saying does not exist. Um, but understandably, and as uh, Raluca, I think, was saying earlier, that's not really satisfactory because it seems like the point of a limit is to kind of talk about the behavior of the Y value, which it is. And to say does not exist just doesn't seem to give us all the information here because I know how the Y value is behaving. I can look at the picture. I know what's, what it's doing. It's, it's, if I'm coming from the left side, it's zero. But if I'm coming from the right side, it's seven. Saying does not exist kind of gives people the impression like we have no idea what's going on. But that's not true in this case. So what we do in cases like this is we can say more information. So this leads to uh, the idea of one-sided limits, we call them. Uh, examples like above. lead to the notion of one-sided limits, they're called. And so these are uh, I'm going to introduce a notation to you. Limit as x approaches a, and you put a little plus sign in the power of the number, right? Like that. Doesn't have to be a different color. I just want to emphasize it, right? So you put a little plus sign. And this is the notation we use to say the limit as x approaches a from the right. And I should probably use pink since I was using that earlier from the right. And the limit as x approaches a, you can put a little negative sign in the power of f of x equals the limit as x approaches a from the left. So here, we invent two new concepts, uh, a concept that takes the concept of a limit, but now it looks at one side at a time. So uh, going back. to the previous example. Right? So we know that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x does not exist. But for some reason, that is unsatisfactory, because anyone with eyes can see that, yeah, technically, we don't fulfill the definition. But I know how the y value is behaving. I can describe it to you in great detail. So for people like that, they have these two new concepts, two with a little plus sign in the power, and limit as x approaches two with a little negative sign in the power. And these can be described. So going back here, what do you think? What is the limit as x approaches two from the left? Zero. Zero. All right, that's, uh, you're getting close to two, you're coming from the left. All right. And now, obviously, if you're approaching two from the right, you are approaching seven. So why is it a little plus and a little minus? Well, clearly, as you can see from the right, it means you're a little bigger than two, 
and you're coming down to two. So you're two plus a little bit, right? From the right. From the left means like you're two minus a little bit. So you have two minus there. So from the left, you put a little two minus. From the right, you put a little two plus. Um, and those can be described. And this talks about, this uh, also leads to the idea of the existence of limits. And that is the limit as X approaches A of F of X only exists if the limit as X approaches A from the right of F of X exists and the limit as X approaches A from the left of F of X exists. And they're equal. If you look in every scenario so far, which is just two, we're going to do a lot more examples eventually. Uh, you'll notice that the left and right agree. If I only looked at the green, the answer I would get is four. If I only look at the pink, the answer I get is four. From all sides, the answer is four. That's unique, unambiguous. Everyone would agree no matter what side they're coming from, right? Same thing for here. Come from the left, the answer I'm getting is five. Come from the right, the answer I'm getting is five. Everyone would agree no matter what side they're coming from, the answer is five, unique, unambiguous. The Y value get close to five when my X value gets close to two. Here, ambiguous. Some people would say the answer is zero if they're looking on the left. Other people would say the answer is seven if they're looking at the right. The fact that there's a disagreement means the limit does not exist. And what that means is that the left and right side did not agree. They gave you two different numbers, right? So now on we take the definition that I can determine what a limit is by looking at the left and the right side. Um, and so if I take the limit from the left and the limit from the right and I get the same answer, then the overall limit exists and I can tell you the answer. If either one of the left or the right limits don't exist or they exist but they disagree, then I would say the limit itself does not exist. Um, I would also note it is possible for uh, the limit as X approaches A and or limit as X approaches A from the right and or limit as X approaches A from the left, to not exist in various combinations, right? So it's possible for a one-sided limit not to exist at all, right? For example, I can give you this function here. Uh, so let's say, again, I'm approaching 2, and I'm looking at this function. And it fills in here. Let's say this is at one, this is at three. Um, so here, um, that's the function. The domain is from two to infinity. I can say the limit as X approaches two from the right of this function is three. The limit as I approach the left does not exist. And the fact that those two are not equal tells us that the overall limit does not exist. Right? Notice that I can't get close from the left. Uh, the limit is all about getting close. There's no part of, there's no function on the left side for me to get close on, right? So coming from the left, there is nothing. It does not exist. There is no function. Um, uh, we can have a, another function that's kind of weird. Let's say again at two, let's say it's filled in here at one. Then I have another part of the function that comes up here. That's uh, an open circle. 
Another part that's at a gap here, still at level one, that's an open circle. Right? Let's say this is at one and this is at three. Here, none of them exist. Uh, the limit as x approaches two of f of x does not exist. Uh, the limit as x approaches two from the right of f of x does not exist. The limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x does not exist. They, none of them exist. Um, of course, f of two exists, that's one. Similarly here, f of two actually existed. The plug-in value does exist, um, but the limit does not, right? So the limit and plugging in a value are different concepts. One can exist when the other one doesn't. And you can have various combinations of your one-sided limits and your limit existing. In order for the overall limit to exist, both of the one-sided limits need to exist and they need to be equal. If they exist, but they're not equal, like here, the limit does not exist. If either one does not exist, then the overall limit does not exist. It's possible for both of them to not exist and the overall limit does not exist. Why does the limit does not exist here? Because it's impossible to get close to two because there is a gap. impossible to get close to two. Sure, we can be at two, but the limit doesn't care about being at two. The limit cares about, am I able to inch closer and closer to two and see what the Y values are doing? In this situation, you cannot, right? So because there's no points on the function around two, you can't approach two, you can't get close to two on the function. Like I couldn't do this, right? I couldn't crawl on my function and get close to two. There's no function for me to crawl on, right? And so that, uh, that's very important. Um, I think we will stop there. Uh, I want to, I'll, I'll, cause next time I'm going to introduce infinity into the mix for now, I just want you guys to just understand some uh, basic limit ideas. I will, in the notes, I'll put some examples down here. Uh, examples to try next time, as well as you can do the homework. I'll add those to the notes. Uh, so I'll put some examples for you guys to try when you're reading over the notes. Next time I'll introduce some new concepts, then we'll go through those examples. And I'll tell you about some strategies, how you can actually do limits more efficiently. Um, with that being said, uh, we will end there, unless there are any uh, last minute, any questions before we end. So I think we'll stop there. I will see you guys uh, in the next one. So ciao.